we really alone in the universe? In the next hour, you'll see extraordinary footage that many believers consider is hard evidence that we're being visited by an alien civilization. Most of this footage has never been seen on television before. We must warn you, if the footage and testimony you are about to see is real, it's perhaps the most important discovery of our time. The Air Force itself has officially admitted that flying saucers exist. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. When I first got to look inside the craft, all I can say it's an ominous feeling. Right now, there's physical proof, actual crafts and technology from another world. That's probably the most important event in history. Hi, I'm James Doohan. In the next hour, we'll examine the controversial evidence and theories that suggest we're not alone in the universe. If these theories prove to be true, the implications are staggering. In recent times, there have been more reported UFO sightings than ever before. For centuries, these crafts have remained a mystery until now. The footage you are about to see is a startling photographic account that sheds light on the greatest question of our century. Are we really alone? In the past decade, over 15 million people have reportedly witnessed extraterrestrial craft. What's more remarkable is that contemporary science has ignored the evidence that for thousands of years has been in plain sight. Recently in Mexico City, millions of astonished onlookers watched as these and other craft hovered over their city. It was the largest mass UFO sighting in history. Mexican officials even held press conferences asking the public to remain calm. What's more amazing is that these sightings are still occurring even today. In what may be one of the most revealing interviews of our time, nuclear physicist Bob Lazar speaks candidly about his top secret work at the government saucer research facility known as Area S4. In 1989, he was hired by the military to back-engineer the propulsion system of an extraterrestrial craft. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if, in fact, that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. When you hear the term UFO, most people think of a classic flying saucer or disc-shaped craft. But what you are about to see is an amazing series of unidentified flying objects that don't fit the typical description of an alien craft. Because of their size, these first craft are believed to be unmanned. They are referred to as probes because they appear to be closely monitoring our activities. This cylindrical-looking probe was videotaped outside Las Vegas, Nevada, where it hovered in the air for over four hours. The next day, the probe returned and was videotaped examining the power lines. Eyewitnesses described this probe as having its own searchlight. It hovered over the same residential area in Florida for three days. A similar object is over the city of Kobe, Japan. This never-before-seen footage was taken of a probe as it scanned the coastline of central Florida. Clearly, we can see it appears to be intelligently controlled. The probe's two sections rotated as it monitors the activities of the photographer. And yet another water sighting. This odd-shaped craft slowly descends to the water, where after pausing for a moment, it slowly rises and departs. Cigar-shaped crafts were first observed in Germany in 1561. Since then, they have frequently appeared in UFO sighting reports. These pictures of a cigar-shaped UFO were taken in California. This UFO was photographed in Earth's orbit. Crowds gathered in Krasnodar, Russia, to marvel at this luminous cigar-shaped UFO. This dramatic footage was later broadcast on Soviet television. The evidence is overwhelming. No single program in history has ever amassed such a compelling collection of footage. We'll use computer analysis, optical enhancement, and expert testimony. The evidence suggests that mankind has been visited since the dawn of time. 
Recently, researchers point to one undeniable event that sparked the largest wave of sightings in history, the detonation of the atomic bomb. Unknowingly, we had sent an invitation to the universe establishing ourselves as an advanced civilization. The Air Force has officially analyzed the motives of possible visitors in space. Here is a direct quotation from the official report. Such a civilization might observe that on Earth we now have atomic bombs. We should therefore expect at this time above all to behold such visitation. As early as 1947, alien craft began responding to our open invitation by arriving in large numbers. If advanced civilizations wanted to monitor our nuclear technology, New Mexico was the place to be. Because of its remote location, New Mexico was the site of the military's atomic research and testing. Post-war missile tests were conducted at White Sands, and Roswell was home to the only atomic bomber squad in the world. To date, the biggest day in Roswell's history remains, July 2nd, 1947, when Mac Brazel, a rancher who lived just outside of Roswell, was startled that evening by a loud explosion outside. The following day, while checking on a remote water pump on his ranch, Mac made an astounding discovery. Spread over an area 100 yards wide and three quarters of a mile long was crash debris. Under top secret security, the debris was collected down to the smallest piece. The base commander had already ordered a press release announcing they had recovered a flying disc. As the news traveled around the world, the phones began to ring off the hook back at the base. The Air Force quickly realized the implications of their hasty press release and issued a cover story. In a press conference held the next day, a metallic reflector was displayed for the reporters as proof the incident was nothing more than a downed weather balloon. Recently declassified government top secret documents confirm the Roswell incident. The report states on July 7, 1947, a secret operation had begun to assure recovery of the wreckage of an alien craft for scientific study. The Roswell incident caught the military off guard. Faced with the fear of widespread public panic, the government began the largest covert operation in history. Their objective was twofold. First, research the alien visitors and their craft, and second, divert the public's attention away from the subject of UFOs. In response to the Roswell crash, then-President Harry Truman formed a special investigative team of 12 hand-picked scientists and military officers to manage the situation. Secretly known as Majestic 12, or MJ-12, the panel's directive was to research the UFO phenomenon and keep it out of the public eye. Recently, private lawsuits and the Freedom of Information Act allowed for the release of many top secret documents from this era. These once top secret papers also clearly describe multiple alien vehicle recovery operations and civilian sighting reports. Even seemingly insignificant alien encounters were documented in great detail and were treated as an issue of national security. General Nathan F. Twining issued a top secret memo relating their findings. The memo stated that, quote, the phenomenon is something real and not visionary or fictitious. There are objects probably approximating the shape of a disk of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft, yet circular or elliptical in shape, flat on the bottom and domed on the top, and making no associated sound. In his report, the general described the alien craft as capable of extreme maneuverability and very evasive when sighted or contacted by friendly aircraft. As the number of sightings increased, the government began more research. The alien crafts represented a technological advantage, and if the government was to maintain the national security, they had to control the situation. But the number of sightings made the job impossible. The public demanded an explanation. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. It was sightings like this one filmed in Kentucky that made the situation impossible to contain. The military had no choice but to try and explain the UFO sightings. During the early 1950s, sightings were being reported in record numbers. 
the Air Force could barely handle the overwhelming volume of calls. The first UFO tracking project was installed in Alaska. The Air Force installed sophisticated cameras and detection equipment aboard specialized reconnaissance planes to retrieve the best possible information on the UFOs. The project was placed under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. I remember one report where an object got in behind the trailing edge of the large wing and ahead of the smaller wing in the position, open position there, and remained for two or three minutes, and they got pictures with all of the movie cameras and the handheld cameras, including the 8x10 Fairchild camera. All of the data that was recorded, SS rolls of film and everything, after a mission with an encounter was removed from the canisters and the equipment items and packed in a metal box and chained to an officer's wrist and flown to Washington that night. And this happened on a frequency of about three or four times a month for the whole year and a half that I was doing this in Alaska. Despite the military's ongoing efforts to divert public attention, the UFO phenomenon took center stage. Aliens made their debut at the World's Fair, and the public was treated to a seemingly endless wave of alien movies. Why UFOs hadn't made their presence known by buzzing the nation's capital, as they had done in the movies. In July 1952, that's exactly what happened, and it happened twice. The New York Times reported formations of glowing disks maneuvered over the Capitol as eyewitnesses on the ground snapped pictures. Radar operators clocked the UFO speeds up to 7,000 miles per hour. One week later, the disks returned. The Air Force said what people had seen was a temperature inversion. The pictures tell a different story. A special session was held in the Pentagon to deal with the situation. The result was a bold new program. Now the military's protocol focused on training and debunking or scientifically disproving the growing phenomenon. So the cover-up began. The armed forces received the order to collect and evaluate UFO reports and to only release misleading explanations to the public. But sightings like the ones filmed by George Adamski hindered military efforts, so the public was given explanations. But a top-secret Air Force memo dated January 1953 tells a different story. The only remaining explanation is the interplanetary answer. Project Blue Book was an effort to finally quell the public's outcry for answers. It was formed to deal with only the best documented cases. In the end, Project Blue Book became known as the Air Force's most successful UFO disinformation campaign. Project Blue Book's objective was to investigate civilian reports of UFO sightings and try to find scientific explanations of these events. Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Stagger was formerly the chief spokesman for the Air Force on the matter. And Major Hector Quintanella is now the chief of Project Blue Book. Major Quintanella, what are the objectives of Project Blue Book? The objectives of the program are twofold. First of all, to try to determine if the UFO phenomena presents a threat to the security of the United States. And second, to determine if the UFO phenomena exhibits any technological advances which could be channeled into research and development. There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. Although congressmen questioned the program, no official conclusions were given. Project Blue Book continued as its research explained sightings like these as seagulls and swamp gas. Many people were not satisfied with these explanations. The Air Force itself has officially admitted that flying saucers exist. This statement appears in Project Saucer Case number 75. Project Blue Book was abruptly terminated. Of the 10,000 cases officially investigated, only a few remained a mystery. The height of the Cold War ushered in the space race. Suddenly, America found itself in a heated competition with Russia to put a man on the moon. America's attention was focused on NASA as space exploration became the nation's top priority. But as NASA soon found out, the Russians weren't the only ones who were watching. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was a race like mankind had never seen before. Who would be the first to conquer the vast distances of space? 
But what MJ-12 and the Air Force already knew, NASA was finding out for themselves. NASA's own logs showed that practically all of their early Gemini and Apollo missions encountered UFOs. In 1985, NASA released UFO footage taken by their astronauts in lunar and terrestrial orbit. This film was taken by astronaut James McDivitt aboard Gemini 4. The next day, he snapped this photo of a cylindrical UFO in Earth's orbit. One day before the historical landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 crew filmed luminous disks in orbit around the moon. On an Apollo 12 film, a bright object was observed with great speed. Even though NASA doesn't officially recognize the alien craft, it has its own extensive written policies governing contact with extraterrestrial life forms. In the mid-1970s, NASA launched the Viking probe. Its mission was to map the surface of Mars. Viking relayed back these pictures of unexplainable structures from the Sidonia region of the planet. Viking's low orbit pass photographed these structures in detail, revealing several giant pyramids and what appears to be a face carved in stone. NASA was quick to respond to the public's claims that they had discovered the proof of an alien civilization. The official explanation for the structures was that the pictures contained missing data and Vikings cameras could not transmit the remaining information. Despite NASA's official position, many astronauts have come forward with their own UFO encounters. James Lovell, Deke Slayton, James McDivitt, Wally Shira, Gordon Cooper, and others have gone public with their encounters. In 1978, Gordon Cooper wrote a letter to the United Nations panel on UFOs stating that these are extraterrestrial vehicles visiting from other planets. In March 1989, the crew of the space shuttle Discovery may have had its own close encounter, speaking on a secret NASA channel. NASA maintains that this is not Colonel Blaha's voice. Another space shuttle mission filmed several disks in high altitude orbit traveling at several thousand miles per hour. Shortly thereafter, NASA began scrambling all shuttle transmissions. Despite the evidence, NASA maintains their official position and has explained these encounters as space debris or spatial anomalies. The turmoil in the 1960s, like the Vietnam War and Watergate, aided the government's debunking program. By the early 1970s, UFOs were no longer the topic of national interest. But despite the government's successful efforts, the sightings continued to increase in numbers. Some experts believe that this is the world's best UFO film. It was taken by Matt Lane Rutherford in Silver Springs, Maryland. Mr. Rutherford took footage after twilight as the disc hovered over his backyard. Scientists examined the footage and concluded the craft appeared to be maneuvering in its own gravitational field. On a morning walk in 1971, an Australian couple photographed this silver disc in flight. In 1977, a Boy Scout in Indiana took this picture of a metallic craft as it circled his house. In 1978, a terrified housewife in Spain snapped a picture of these UFOs while watching the sunset. In 1978, the United Nations released statistics showing that since 1947, 63,144 UFO sightings were reported. That's approximately one every four hours. Even President Jimmy Carter had his own alien encounter. While governor of Georgia, he filed this seven-page UFO report stating he spotted a glowing UFO for 12 minutes in the skies over Georgia. The report was personally signed by Carter himself. Filming on a British Airways commercial, the crew captured this luminous UFO maneuvering alongside the Concorde. This sighting was filmed from the parking lot of the Rio Casino Hotel. When the footage was enhanced, a disc-shaped craft can be seen with a dome on the top and a series of portholes surrounding the craft. In 1991, eyewitnesses screamed as a photographer took this picture off Manhattan Island as a disc emerged from the river and flew off. This craft was photographed rising out of the water in Australia as it docked with a smaller dark object. 
This UFO was spotted in Denver, Colorado, as witnesses watched from a neighbor's backyard. It was rare that sightings like these gained much national attention. But President Ronald Reagan's speech to students at Falston High School soon changed all that. Suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries. Two years later, President Reagan made international headlines when he repeated the alien theme to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. President Reagan's speeches started the public asking questions again. The Cold War era created a defense industry based solely on high technology. As the stealth bombers rolled off the assembly line, rumors surfaced that the military was test flying recovered alien craft at a secret government base known as Area 51. If the military was going to test fly alien craft, Area 51 was the perfect place to do it. Located some 125 miles outside of Las Vegas, it is one of the least populated expanses in the United States. Area 51 is surrounded on three sides by military testing grounds and hidden from public view behind the Groom Mountain Range, the base as it appeared in the 1960s. Since then, satellite images have shown the base has expanded immensely. Only a handful of photographs of the base exist, and until recently, the government officially denied its existence. This rare and never-before-seen footage of the base was taken by amateur photographers risking imprisonment if accidentally venturing on government land. But in the mid-1980s, the government seized the adjacent public land, closing off all access to any prying eyes. Sophisticated detection equipment monitors the public BLM land surrounding the base and private security forces patrol to deter any unwanted lookers. These unmarked black helicopters are used to buzz automobiles scaring off UFO bus hoping to snap a photo. But it's photographs like these taken over the Groom Mountain Range that seemingly confirm the rumors of the reported test flights. This amateur videotape shows what eyewitnesses saw hover over the base for several minutes before landing. Area 51 has been called the best known secret military base in America. The rumors subsided and in 1996, the state of Nevada renamed the highway which runs parallel to the base. In a massive dedication ceremony open to the press, thousands watched as the governor of Nevada unveiled road signs proclaiming Highway 375 as the extraterrestrial highway. Now, former government employee and nuclear physicist Bob Lazar breaks his silence. In this extraordinary interview, he discusses his classified work at the military's top secret saucer research facility known as S-4. In 1989, he was hired by the military to back-engineer the propulsion system of an extraterrestrial craft. Lazar worked at what is undoubtedly the most top-secret research facility in the world, S-4. There was no, absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S-4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. According to Lazar, the military had not been test flying alien craft at Area 51. Rather, the disks many had videotaped and photographed were actually being flown out of S-4, just several miles away. The S-4 facility is an area just off the Papoose lake bed, dry lake bed, and consists of nine hangars. The hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. At the time that I was working there at uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, there was a special projects eg and building. When I was told to go to work, I drove there, parked my car there, got in a plane at the airport, flew to Groom Lake, where I deplaned and waited for a bus, and the bus drove me down to uh, S-4. 
The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I, I think it was the third time I was up there. Upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years, and you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And uh, an extraterrestrial vehicle that, you know, this wasn't man-made. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking, and I gave it the name the Sport Model. Um, there was one that looked like a Jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Uh, there was a disc that was turned up on its side, and it had a large projectile hole with the metal bent outwards on it. Uh, I can only surmise they were testing it to see if uh, you know, a projectile could penetrate it. Alien crafts like the one Bob worked on had already been sighted throughout the world, but until Lazar entered the disc, he thought it was man-made. It probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as what we were doing, the fact that we weren't building this thing. We were trying to find out how it was made. We were back engineering it. When I first got to look inside the craft, the, the, all I can say, it's an ominous feeling. You walk in there and uh, it's, it feels as if you shouldn't be there. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's a real ominous feeling. It's not an exciting feeling. Uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions in your mind. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. The craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right, quite a scientific feat, to lift something completely silently, under control, and uh, you know, perform a maneuver like that. From deep inside the underground test facility, Lazar learned how these craft operate by studying their propulsion systems. I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower, uh, the lower level, essentially. And there were three large gravity amplifiers. These devices looked like about a two-foot diameter, four-foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above, and they can be independently positioned. Uh, and that's what, what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward. The crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do, is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity or two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill, and the craft rolls downhill for infinity. As seen here, these craft don't always fly in a similar fashion. They have been seen and photographed flying in radically different positions. Lazar explains. There's what they call Omicron configuration, where the craft is using one generator uh, or a delta configuration where it's utilizing all three. Delta configuration would be for space travel. Essentially the craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point and move through space that way. It's always chasing a little distortion. Gravity will vary somewhat and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is, is kind of unstable for the most part. Lazar was also able to shed light on one of the phenomenon that's commonly seen in so many sightings. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. What you're dealing with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. Well, when you're on the outside 
you know, it's a crime against the people and, and all that, but uh, you know, y your feelings change once you're privy to the information. Before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the, uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. One of the least known aspects of the UFO phenomenon may be the most chilling. With today's sophisticated computer technology and special effects, it's possible to fake a picture or alter video. But this modern technology hasn't always existed. We've uncovered startling new evidence that suggests that mankind has been visited since the beginning of recorded history. This is the oldest known picture of a UFO sighting. Or is it? The earliest recorded sightings occurred in Pakistan over 7,000 years ago. In this dramatic Stone Age cave painting, we can clearly see a human-like being wearing what appears to be a helmet complete with antenna. In the background, we can see a classic saucer-shaped craft. Archaeologists discovered this 15,000-year-old cave painting in southern France showing disc-shaped craft flying over ritual hunting grounds. So many saucer-shaped craft were depicted, the archaeology team put together a catalog to illustrate the various shapes and sizes. In a Japanese cave painting, we see a large, luminous craft hovering over a crowd watching from below. Throughout the Middle Ages, we can also see evidence of similar flying ships. In some cases, the craft resembles saucers photographed in modern times. This fresco in a monastery in Yugoslavia shows a manned craft flying above the people below. This painting was found in one of the oldest churches in Russia. It shows two flying disks with onlooking faces observing the crucifixion. Much about man's oldest civilization, the Sumerians remains a mystery, except that the remnants of their ancient culture inexplicably appears even today, and their preserved records show contact with alien beings. A recent crop formation found in England depicts two worlds in contact above the Sumerian symbol translated to read the nobles with their flying starships. As shown in these videotapes, most of these crop formations coincide with UFO sightings. In 1975, the first documented contact case, a farmer named Billy Meyer made international headlines by taking hundreds of photographs and filming 20 minutes of what some consider is the best UFO footage in the world. Edward Billy Meyer is the eyewitness in one of the most famous yet controversial UFO cases in history. He gained worldwide attention by going public with his alien encounters. Despite the clarity of his photos and films, they remain controversial because he claims to have been in contact with the alien visitors. On January the 28th, 1975, he had his first sighting in the Swiss countryside of Hinwell. According to Billy, he heard a low-pitched hum as he looked up to see a silver disc-shaped craft descending upon him. He was able to snap off a few shots with his camera. One month later, on March 8, 1975, Billy photographed this ship moving along the tree line. This was one of the first UFO pictures to be analyzed by optical computer enhancement. An independent lab confirmed the photograph was considered genuine. March 29, 1976 marked the appearance of a new disc Meyer later referred to as a Variation Type 4 craft. Shortly thereafter, Billy was able to obtain metal samples from one of his encounters. This electron microscope footage of the metal samples was part of an analysis conducted in the United States. Two laboratories independently confirmed the combination of metals were intricately machined, cold fused together, and could not have been produced here on Earth. Shortly after Billy's encounters began, he started to bring his 8mm movie camera with him and filmed several amazing sequences of hovering craft. Perhaps the most striking piece of evidence in the Meyer case is this film clip of a metallic disc hovering over a road below. 
In this daylight shot, we can clearly see the graceful motion of the metallic disc as two different cars drive directly under it. Skeptics maintained that the photos and footage were too good to be true. By April 4th, 1978, the contacts had stopped. Billy claims to have had a total of 105 sightings over the three-year period. As we've just seen, it is possible for one individual to have multiple alien encounters. But when a city or entire country repeatedly witnesses alien craft, it's called a mass sighting. In 1991, Mexico City and the surrounding cities experienced the largest mass sighting in recent history. This extraordinary phenomenon continues even today. Without any warning, they appeared. On July 11, 1991, the world's most populated city was caught off guard. Cameras were rolling as amateur photographers videotaped a solar eclipse. Disc-shaped craft appeared and hovered over the city for almost an hour. Its appearance marked the beginning of the most dramatic mass sighting ever recorded. Guillermo Araguin from Mexico City was the first to come forward with this footage. When optically enhanced, it clearly reveals the rotating motion of the metallic disc. Meanwhile, 85 miles away in Puebla, a cameraman took this footage of a nearly identical craft. Split screen enhancement shows the striking similarities between the two. Another witness filmed this craft. The computer enhancement reveals further details of the craft during the mass sighting. In the days following the eclipse, the sightings continued to grow in numbers. This luminous object was filmed as it flew across the city. Optical enhancements reveal the craft as it travels at a high rate of speed. This UFO was videotaped from an apartment balcony in the city. The photographer filmed this craft as it maneuvered around an industrial building and vanished out of sight. Public outcry for an official explanation forced the government to respond to the mass sightings. In the only press conference held on the subject, the mayor of Atlisco asked his citizens to remain calm as there were no reports of injuries or damages caused by the alien craft. In one of the more dramatic moments, this amateur video captured a metallic disc traveling through the clouds as it stopped in midair and reversed direction. No conventional aircraft can fly in this manner. UFO were even present during their Independence Day celebration. A military parade and a massive air show commemorated the occasion. As jets flew overhead, a metallic craft, it accelerated, leaving them in its wake. In the last hour, we've shown you photographs, film clips, videotape, government files, and expert testimony documenting one of the greatest mysteries of our time. The evidence is overwhelming. From ancient artifacts to modern-day sightings, the evidence presents itself. Now, only you can decide. Are we really alone? Ever since man has looked up into the stars, he has seen strange objects in the skies. But the search for proof of extraterrestrial intelligence has produced disappointing results. The best so-called evidence has only been a few photographs and film clips. But now, all that's about to change. Since 1985, more than 15 million Americans have reportedly witnessed unidentified flying objects. But despite the seemingly overwhelming evidence, mainstream science has chosen to ignore the subject. But now, for the first time in history, one of the greatest mysteries of this century is unraveling. A former government scientist has come forward to discuss the military's classified work on extraterrestrial spacecraft. The ever-increasing pace of achievement in the last several decades is unparalleled in human history. The high cost of developing and producing these technologies has limited the number of contenders from the private sector, leaving the government and large corporate businesses on the cutting edge of new discoveries. Always in the public eye, big business competes for high paying contracts the next big thing to satisfy the masses. The government, on the other hand, must conceal information concerning national security, 
that for obvious reasons should not be public knowledge. But when it comes to matters concerning the welfare of our planet, the living beings on it, or potential clues to the mysteries of the universe, many believe it should be our right to know. The end of World War II and the invention of the atomic bomb signaled a new era of international mistrust. Since the earliest days of the Cold War, which coincides with the Roswell incident and the start of the modern UFO era, the military has been especially secretive about its advances and achievements while always searching for the perfect weapon or super sophisticated tool of espionage. High-tech surveillance equipment around the world and even in space has allowed global intelligence to see and be aware of many things that the common civilian cannot even begin to imagine. The military recruits many talented civilians when special expertise is required. And propulsion systems expert Bob Lazar claims he was one of them. In this exclusive interview, he gives his detailed account of his employment with the Department of Naval Intelligence at the top secret facility known as S-4, where, according to Bob, he was hired to work on recovered alien spacecraft. S-4 is located 125 miles north of Las Vegas and 15 miles south of Groom Lake. This now not-so-secret military base at Groom Lake, Nevada, is known as Area 51, or Dreamland, as insiders like to call it. Born in 1959 in Coral Gables, Florida, Bob has lived much of his life in Las Vegas, Nevada. With degrees in physics and electronics from MIT and Caltech, he has dabbled in everything from chemistry to fireworks in an effort to understand the finer points of propulsion. He has even assembled a jet car with a 22,000 horsepower engine salvaged from a Navy F3D Sky Knight that is capable of land speeds of over 350 miles per hour. Fate took a serious turn for Bob in 1982. Arriving early for a lecture at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico given by Dr. Edward Teller, one of the inventors of the atomic bomb, Bob was able to meet and talk to the famous physicist. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was reading the local paper, The Monitor, with a featured front page article on Bob, and the two struck up a conversation. Later, Bob sent Dr. Teller his resume for consideration, and soon after, Bob was hired by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. This Los Alamos-based directory lists Bob as an employee. By 1989, Bob was brought into the top secret program at S4, known as Project Galileo. In the following interview, Bob reveals many details of this amazing experience. Did you witness any disk technology at Area 51? No, there was no, absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S-4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. How long were you employed at S-4? And when were you hired? When was I hired at S4? I guess early 89. And I was probably there only about six months or so uh, on a very infrequent basis. How were you transported to and from work? At the time that I was working there at uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, there was a special projects EG&G building. When I was told to go to work, I drove there, parked my car there, uh, and got in a plane at the airport, flew to Groom Lake, where I deplaned and waited for a bus, and the bus drove me down to uh, S-4. The S-4 facility is off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed, and it consists of nine hangars, the hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. Around the opposite end of the hangars, there's the standard entrance where you're dropped off at, you go through a security check, and inside there's a small complex. Uh, there is some office space, there's several laboratories, the hangars themselves, of course, and uh, a few other places. I didn't have free reign to go wherever I wanted to. Everywhere I went to, I was essentially escorted, so... Uh, Inside the facility, uh, what was the basic layout? Were there underground levels? 
I don't think there were any underground levels to it, though there, there could have been. I, I don't think it was uh, you know, an extensive underground facility. It just looked like uh, an installation that was butt up against a mountain. And uh, you know, I didn't see any evidence of any stairs going down, elevators, or, uh, but like I said, I don't know. There could have been, and I just might not have been permitted in those areas. It's difficult to, uh, to really surmise how long it had been operational. Everything did look fairly new. Uh, by that I mean I don't think this installation was there in the early 70s. Uh, nothing was worn. Uh, things looked fairly freshly painted. So, uh, you know, a as a ballpark guess, I would say it would, it would really surprise me if the installation was older than five, seven, ten years, something like that. What agency is in charge of S4? Who controls the program? I was paid by the Department of Naval Intelligence and what they're doing researching extraterrestrial craft is beyond me. Where my checks came from so I can only assume that uh, they were in charge of that. Did you see high-level government or military personnel at S-4? No, not at S-4. Anywhere in, in the overall facility at all? At Area 51, I believe I, I saw some military personnel, but, uh, you know, no, no, one, no one I can identify or rank or, you know. Is this research confined to the U.S. government, or did you see any international involvement? At one time, the Russians were involved, and supposedly there was some breakthrough made by our team, however this project was split up. And right after that happened, uh, the Russians were no longer permitted on the facility at all. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all I know about it. What was discovered, why they were kicked out, when they started working with us, is all unknown to me. You were hired to replace a scientist killed in the project. What exactly happened there? This is what I was told, that I was hired uh, to replace one of a couple people that were killed uh, while working on one of the reactors from one of the crafts. Apparently they, for whatever reason, cut open an operating reactor and the device exploded, killing both of them. The scientists that were killed there uh, allegedly, the detonation from the explosion was fairly large. Uh, it would have rivaled a small tactical nuke. So it was done at the Nevada test site, and it was to be passed off as an un unannounced nuclear, nuclear test. Did you have any direct contact or communication with aliens? No, not at all. Tell us about the briefing files. Under what conditions did you gain access to them? I was put into the briefing room with uh, 121 or 22 briefings and really was just told to sit and read through them. I think they were there just to mainly educate me on, on what was going on. They weren't a complete in-depth in explanation on everything else, but just uh, essentially a brief synopsis on some of the other projects that were going on there. Supposedly, the information, now this isn't something that I determined, it's something I was told, that uh, the crafts originated from uh, a planet that orbited the Zeta Reticuli star system, Zeta Reticuli 1 and Zeta Reticuli 2, or two, two stars of a binary star system. Uh, the craft allegedly came from there. One or two autopsy photographs I saw uh, dealt with just a small photograph, a bus shot essentially, just head, shoulders, and chest of an alien with a uh, uh, chest was cut open in a T fashion and one single organ was removed. Uh, the organ itself in the, in the other picture was uh, cut and vivisectioned essentially, the, uh, showing the different chambers in there. Uh, this was totally unrelated to anything I was doing, but from that photograph it looked like what you see in UFO lore as the typical gray. So how tall it was from what I could see, I, I couldn't tell because I only saw a portion of the photograph. But if everything else you see is correct, I would imagine it was three and a half or four feet tall. But uh, there again, you know, all I had to see was a photograph. And 
You mentioned these beings have historically interacted with man. How? What was involved there? Allegedly, this interaction has occurred since, you know, man was a simian creature. And, uh, you know, there were genetic alterations made. How specifically did the briefings detail how the aliens manipulated our genetics over the centuries? It mentioned 65 or 63 uh, corrections or additions to the genetic makeup uh, that finally resulted in you know, a, a human creature. In an earlier interview, you had mentioned you saw what you thought may be an alien. Was it an alien? What did you see? What I had said and all that occurred was I was walking by a door, uh, a door that had a small 9x9 nine nine window in it, little wires running through it, and uh, either technicians, scientists, or whoever they were, looking down at something. And what that something was caught my eye, and I never really did see what it was. A lot of people have asserted, well, there was an alien, and there are aliens working around there, and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I don't think that was the case. But uh, who knows? I was, you know, you're seeing all these fantastic things, and your mind gets going, and you know, you catch something out of the corner of your eye. Who knows what your mind's going to come up with? So I, I certainly wouldn't stand on that as fact by any means. What was the incident in 1979 that brought the alien exchange program of information to a halt? Again, this is a story that was relayed to me, and. Uh, Allegedly, what happened in 79, there was some sort of information exchange going on where there were actual live aliens at the facility. And at one particular point, there was an area where some security personnel went to enter. And apparently, because of not the sidearms, but the bullets in the sidearms, from what I understand, if they would have entered the area, the bullets would have detonated. Uh, and supposedly one of the creatures tried to stop the security personnel from entering the area and a fight ensued and the bottom line from the altercation was that the uh, security personnel I don't remember how many were involved but were all killed and they died of head wounds and that's all that all that I heard of that story what was your job description at S4 my official job description was a st senior staff physicist. Uh, I don't know if I actually had that position when I was there, because I was there so infrequently. I wasn't supervising anyone, so I, uh, that, that was the official position I was hired under. But What was the size of the staff working on Project Galileo? Well, there were 22 people employed. And that was specifically for the Galileo project? No, for the entire project. There were 22 people with majestic clearance. I had majestic clearance. Majestic clearance was designated as uh, clearance 38 levels above Q clearance. And Q clearance is the civilian uh, top secret clearance. When did you see your first disc? The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I, I think it was the third time I was up there. Uh, normally, the bus pulled around to the opposite end of the facility which was the main entrance, and that's where we went in. On um, this particular occasion, it pulled up to one of the hangar doors, which were normally closed, and the, the last one was open. We came out, and I saw the disc in the hangar. Uh, upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years and you know people have just caught it being tested so on and so forth and uh, it never even occurred to me even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle that you know this wasn't man-made when did you realize the craft was not of earthly origin well it probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole as what we were doing the fact that we weren't building this thing we were trying to find out how it was made we were back engineering it what is back engineering well back engineering is taking a finished product and finding out 
how the device or product was produced and essentially determining whether or not you can duplicate it. Now, scientists aside, what was your emotional response? What were you thinking were the implications to the world or man in general from these revelations? I really didn't think about implications of, of, of that sort. As far as emotionally, when I first got to look inside the craft, the, the, all I can say, it's an ominous feeling. You walk in there and uh, it's, it feels as if you shouldn't be there. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's a real ominous feeling. It's not an exciting feeling. Uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions in your mind. Well, where did this come from? And you know that they won't give you the answers to the whole story, but it's, uh, that's the only way I can describe it. How many craft are housed at S4? And are they, in fact, all dish-shaped? There are nine, and their shapes vary. I only got to do a close inspection on one of them. Uh, the others I just briefly saw, and they, they pretty much varied. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking, and I gave it the name the sport model. Um, there was one that looked like a jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Uh, there was a disc that was turned up on its side, and it had a large projectile hole with the metal bent outwards on it. Uh, I can only surmise they were testing it to see if uh, you know, a projectile could penetrate it. Of course, it's just a guess on my part. But for the most part, they were pretty, pretty varied. How many times did you enter the disc, or did you only enter the sport model? I only entered the sport model. The other ones, I wasn't uh, allowed to loiter around, to go near, really even to look at. I just, at one point, walking through the hangar doors, all the bay doors between all the hangars were open, and I got a, a glimpse all the way down uh, of the whole corridor. But that was the only time it was ever open. Tell us about the lower level of the craft, where the gravity generators are located. The lower level of the craft, the floor itself is hexagonal, little hexagonal squares. And the hatch, or if you want to call it a hatch, the access way to get in there, is an ingenious little assembly. It's a honeycomb structure. And if you put your fingers in one end of the honeycomb and push, all the honeycombs will collapse in on each other, making a hole. It's something that I haven't seen before, and it's kind of a novel idea. But a very efficient, lightweight, very strong uh, access way. Uh, I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower, uh, the lower level, essentially. And there were three large gravity amplifiers. These devices looked like about a two-foot diameter, four-foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above, and they can be independently positioned. Uh, and that's what, what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft. The second level was the only other level that I was on. It was the main level uh, that contained the reactor where the seating was, the gravity amplifiers themselves, though we also called the devices that hung down on the lower level the gravity amplifiers because they were really one and the same. They were probably the waveguides or horns, if you want to relate that to microwaves. Um, and really, that's about it. That's all that was on that level. So it's assumed this was not made for a human pilot. It would be extremely inconvenient for a human pilot. Humans really can't even function in there the, because of the ceiling clearance, uh, the seats were so tiny, uh, it was obviously made for a creature much smaller than a human. How does the craft achieve lift? It produces a gravity wave, which is similar to the gravity wave that the Earth produces. However, the craft phase shifts the wave. In other words, it, it turns the wave not really in an opposite polarity, but something to that effect where it will work against the natural gravity wave of the Earth, and it produces lift in, in that effect. Is there any internal protection for the crew? Does the craft generate a, uh, a gravitational field inside the craft itself? Well, the craft generates its own gravitational field. Being inside that field, 
essentially doesn't shield you, but it, essentially you're in, <laughs> and this is a, a terrible way to say it, almost in a different realm, because you're, you're now influenced only the, by that gravitational field. For instance, people wonder how a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed, a 90 degree turn when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect. Well, that, that really wouldn't happen. Inertia would have no effect. Uh, you're, you're in a distortion. And don't forget that gravity distorts time and space. So really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there. Describe the gravity amplifiers for us and some of their different operating configurations. There are three amplifiers. The craft can operate on a single one can lift off the ground. The way in which it's propelled are two different ways. There's what they call Omicron configuration, where the craft is using one generator, uh, or Delta configuration, where it's utilizing all three. Delta configuration would be for space travel. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, as opposed to a science fiction movie where you see a flying saucer moving around, the craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. Moving around a source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference, essentially. So what they do is they work with that interference to their benefit. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward, the crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity, two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill. And the craft rolls downhill for infinity. It's always chasing a little distortion. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed because they're essentially and any time you run over you know the gravity field around the earth is not completely constant and stable depending on the minerals and density of the earth underneath it the gravity will vary some you will get odd movements of the craft so it's low speed mode is is kind of unstable for the most part I only witnessed one test flight up close officially uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. Uh, the test was going off probably, you know, uh, just as the sun was going down. And it was a, a low performance test. I believe there were uh, some pilots or test pilots in the craft. The craft must have been retrofitted to fit them because the seating arrangements were really not accommodating. Um, they were in radio communication with the craft, which is kind of surprising to me because the gravity waves that the craft was producing should have uh, distorted the radio waves also. So uh, apparently there's something there that I don't understand. Um, the craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. However, that was an extremely impressive test. Uh, maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything, that, that wouldn't be a whole lot. But you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter. I don't know exactly how much it weighed, but it weighed a lot. And uh, it was quite quite a scientific feat to lift something completely silently under control and uh, you know perform a maneuver like that. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal, it was cold to the touch, that's why I say it was metal, but it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. Had no seams, it was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. When you're on the outside, you know, you, you pretty much think, you know, how could they keep something like this secret? It's a crime against 
science, it's a crime against the people and, and all that, but you know, your feelings change once you're privy to the information. Once I was inside, I mean, there was kind of a bit of selfishness. You know, well, I know about it now, this is great, you know, we should keep it secret just so we all know about it. And you know, that really does go through your mind, though after a while it wears off, but uh, you, know, you felt privileged to be privy to the information. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there, these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science current science right now identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research at S4 or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most familiar with uh, holding planets in orbit, holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a produces a gravitational field, and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space. Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. How are vast distances of space traveled by amplifying a gravitational field? Well, because space, time, and gravity are all interrelated, if you could produce gravity artificially, an extremely intense field of gravity, what you could do is actually distort the distance between two objects and make it shorter. Not just distorting the distance, but now you're also decreasing the time, the actual time between the two places. So you're not traveling in a linear mode like flying a spacecraft from point A to point B. You're, you've actually modified the time and the space that you travel in. So you're now traversing a huge amount of distance with little time, and actually with traveling little distance. As crazy as it seems, that, that's what's going on. What are some of the inherent problems with traveling at the speed of light? There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, 
navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam uh, configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus, focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the, uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the heavy ion research lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient. It's in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again, somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that. But uh, that's, that's where 115 is. I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or 
you know, it was separate cargo somewhere. You know, anyone can speculate, but I was, I was told that was the, the figure. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. You witnessed several nighttime test flights unofficially while off the base. What did you see? The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends who I had brought out there. I, at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers, I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect. But I missed some of the most uh, impressive maneuvers. But the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up, other than the fact that it went above the mountain range, uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed. How were you able to find out about the test flight schedules? The test flight schedules were told to me, uh, specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times. And at that time, the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights. And from what they said, that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area. And that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft, but uh, as far as there being an exhaust, there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well, that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons. They emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a, really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light. The same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolts. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or uh, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers. Tell us a little more about the aurora you witnessed taking off out of Area 51. When I was leaving the uh, Area 51 facility heading down to S4, there was a tremendous roar. And I have described it as uh, the sound like the sky was tearing. And I couldn't see out the windows of the bus. All I can see out was the, the very front. And as we came by, I asked Dennis, who was my supervisor and on the bus at that time, he said what that was. He said it was an aurora a high-altitude research plane, and um, it was a large craft, and the one glimpse I got of it was from the rear, and it had two huge square exhausts with vanes in them, and uh, it was just, it sounded more like a rocket than a jet. I don't know. I even think he did mention that it was liquid methane powered, but um, there again, you know, working on the disk technology, I really could care less what was rolling around at Area 51, but uh, it, it, it did catch my eye. As a result of going public, have there been any attempts made on your life? One day when I was getting on um, Interstate 15, driving down Charleston Boulevard, uh, a car came up alongside of me, and uh, I thought he was just trying to race me to get on the freeway. Uh, this was after I had left the project. Um, it was a white, boxy-looking car, exactly what make and model, I don't know. But um, I accelerated to get on the freeway to go fast, and there was a gunshot, and the back of the car was hit, and I skidded off into the uh, median. And I stopped, and I was frightened, and I just stood there because I thought the guy was going to be alongside of me and just shoot me. I had nothing to do. I was essentially paralyzed with with fear and I waited there and then nothing else happened and 
do I know it was a government agent trying to kill me? No, could it have been a drive-by shooting? Maybe. Uh, you know, so... It wasn't, I mean, it was an attempt on my life, but by who specifically, I, I don't know. Though I was threatened uh, before I had left. that They threatened my wife's life and my life, so... In an earlier interview, you had mentioned that they had put a gun to your head. Tell us about that. That was after we were caught out when I had the test flight schedule and uh, I brought some friends out to show them the disc test. Uh, we got caught out there and the following day I was debriefed down at Indian Springs Air Force Base and um, I was in the room with the security guards that caught us, my supervisor and some other people and uh, some of the security personnel. Uh, yeah, they were essentially grilling me about security and, you know, how could I possibly bring people out there and uh, I guess I wasn't as responsive as they would like and they got in my face and one of them pulled a sidearm out and, you know, just pushed it against me. Have you maintained any contacts with your colleagues out at S4? No, I never heard from anyone other than for a very brief time after I left Dennis, who was my supervisor, did try and make contact with me at the, uh, the meeting place was the Union Plaza Hotel. And I took a, a friend of mine, Gene Huff, down there, and another friend, uh, a former colleague and scientist from Los Alamos. And we did, uh, we saw him, but I also did recognize some security personnel walking around there from S4. So whether or not it was a setup or what was going on or he was trying to talk to me, we never found out and we left. It just was a, a real strange situation. I never heard from him since. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed? Uh, I would say considerably. And before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the, uh, one of the guys that thought you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Um, I even remember before I was involved there, John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. And uh, I was also under the impression that, you know, boy, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know, they're out here to protect us and all that. You know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government <laughs> is doing everything but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking out is for themselves. You know, uh, obviously the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are, and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if, in fact, that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. Actual crafts and technology from another world. And uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality, in my mind. And uh, it really just, I guess, opened my eyes. The big thing is whether or not we can duplicate them. I mean, if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is, that's great. But if we can't duplicate it, it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at. And then once we understand it is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology and you know unless we've got a handle on both of them all that technology is useless to us after all that's been said and done would you do this over again what would you do differently I would probably have played along for a longer time um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that. You know, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems. But um, 
I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was, uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on a propulsion or field propulsion or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But, um, you know, if they turned it over to the scientific community here in the United States, I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there. Uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the security itself that prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that, where you work in isolated groups, and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere, and that's, that's the problem they have. What does the future hold for Bob Lazar? Well, I'm not really involved in any of that stuff anymore. That's kind of put behind me. Um, I have my own businesses that I work at, uh, some computer graphics, uh, some consultation, um, other technical jobs, uh, radiation detectors, and a few other things like that. Um, so really, I just go about my life, and that's you know something that happened that was fantastic, and and it's over. But uh, it's kind of hard to shake it loose. But eventually, I will, and that'll be that. I think all the surveillance and everything stopped. I don't think anyone's bothering to monitor me. I've I've said everything that I know. It's been all over the place, so it's kind of uh, a done deal. As far as whether or not there are any craft out there, I believe you know they were out and gone in probably the late 89, early 90. And the only thing people see now out there are you know, either flares or planes coming into land. But uh, that's about it. Did you have an interest in flying saucers or science fiction in general as a child? I was never interested in flying saucers as a child. Science fiction, you know, I watched Star Trek, I guess, with everyone else back then. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I didn't even believe in flying saucers up until I was employed at S4. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev. When you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well. I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us, we can bring about that realization. Thank you all. God bless you all.